Welcome to Delightful Descent. It's episode 32, and today I'm going to be talking to Dan Nolson, who's a cacao ceremonialist, teacher, and mentor, about the assumption it's just chocolate. And this is a really interesting one, because I, I think on the surface of it, it might sound slightly different to quite a lot of Delightful Descent episodes, but there's some really juicy stuff here about the relationship between how something comes to be, uh, the context we experience it in, and, and the effect that it has. So it's it's a really big one for me. And I think it's actually a really, there's, there's all sorts of really interesting stuff. So yeah, welcome, Dan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Lovely to be with you. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, oh, I see the camera's misbehaving already. That's good. Um, so yeah, welcome to Deli it, welcome to Delightful Descent. And if you, if you haven't seen the show before, you're new to the show. This is an idea that came up from my work about people taking a different approach and making their own way. Um, and Dan is one of these people, as as pretty much all of my guests are. And it, one of the challenges I find in doing this work is that there are lots of hidden barriers, these kind of implicit beliefs that we don't really think about on the surface, but that are quite deep assumptions that, that really get in the way of doing what we want to do. And this is a show about kind of challenging those and, and, and revisiting those and seeing what's going on. Um, it's to give you in the audience some ideas about uh, how you can challenge stuff yourself and to give you some ideas about, you know, some, some specific things that you might want to rethink, um, that you might enjoy rethinking. It's also very much about um, getting comfortable with and normalizing this idea of exploration uh, and being in spaces where there isn't always a clear answer and an easy answer. Um, so this kind of the messy edges of stuff, are, are, well, I'm really interested in exploring uh, on the show and in general, really. Um, <laughs> And it's called Delightful Descent because, yeah, it is about challenging assumptions. It is about challenging ideas. But it's not about proving ourselves right at someone else's expense. It's about playing with stuff and exploring and, and, and having some fun rather than it all being this kind of really kind of serious thing that's about proving the other side wrong. So uh, this show is also genuinely live. So if there are any technical issues or anything, please do bear with us. And we don't know where this conversation will go. It's not scripted. Um, we do often talk about some relatively challenging topics on the show, and there is sometimes strong language. So if either of those things are an issue for you watching, then please do be warned that those might occur. Um, there aren't any perfect answers here, as I said. This is, um, but so please do ask questions of yourself as you're watching or listening, and please do ask us questions. Um, if you're watching live, you can ask in the chat on YouTube, and we will uh, be able to answer your questions live. Otherwise, there'll be stuff about how to get in touch with either of us at the end of the show. So, um, yeah, I first met um, Dan. Well, I was actually introduced to him by a previous guest. Um, and when I was introduced, uh, when, I, when, I, when I first heard, I was like, I wasn't entirely sure um, that we'd actually have something, we'd have a lot of common ground and something really interesting to talk about. But when we did, we had uh, we had a huge amount of resonance. And I was uh, really enjoyed that first conversation mm -hmm. and, and really wanted to get Dan on the show. And I think Dan's using chocolate and and cacao ceremonies in really creative ways and, and kind of using something for me that's slightly unexpected as a tool for transformational change. So I think there's something really great in that and I really wanted to get, get him on. So yeah, um, so that's enough of me talking. Uh, Dan, could you uh, share maybe a little bit about, yeah, uh, your work and uh, the kind of people that you like to work with, please? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thank you, Matthew. Um, I, well, I guess there's sort of two strands to, to what I how I work with cacao. Um, and there's one side, which is um, a raw chocolate business that I run with my wife. Um, that's where I am right now. A company called Elements for Life. And we make a range of raw chocolate products, chocolate making kits, um, hot chocolate blends, chocolate making ingredients, all sorts of things like that. Um, so that's sort of one aspect. And that's where my journey with cacao began. Um, and through that, it has evolved. Um, the other side of my sort of journey with cacao is um, working with it ceremonially um, and that's using cacao in ceremony using it as a tool like you say for transformational change um, i work with it in different ways um, with that um, but it's it's used as a, a heart opening plant medicine essentially that's what it's what it's renowned as so it's using it as a tool to help people connect to their own hearts connect to themselves and connect to each other so i run regular ceremonies uh, working with cacao and fire and shamanic journeying um, i also teach and mentor people uh, along their journey with cacao 
So those are the sort of two strands of my cacao journey, and there's other bits which have woven into that to make it what it is today. Ah, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a really interesting thing, and you know, it's one of the things I'd like to explore today about that combination of making making chocolate and doing cacao ceremonies. And I think there's a there's an interesting. Um, we were we were chatting just before the show about you know when we a lot of people on the show and my own you know in, in my own experience as well is actually having a lot of different aspects to our work and and how those come together in a cohesive way and how we explain that is actually a kind of a challenging thing sometimes and a really interesting thing i think it, it, it's great to uh, great to get into that so yeah um before we get fully into the assumption though um, i always like to ask my guests uh, for a quote that they'd like to share um have you got one for us I have indeed, and unsurprisingly, it's from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, I, 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 there are so many great quotes from Ralph Dahl in all his books, and obviously working with cacao, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a, a dear book for me. Um, and it, there's so many quotes. I know, now, narrowed it down to two. The one that I've, I've, I've got, I'm going with today is, so shines a good deed in a weary world. <laughs> um, because it feels to me that we're in a weary world, particularly at the moment, after the past 16, 18 months of all sorts of shenanigans going on. And certainly I'm tired of where we are and I, people I speak to are very tired of where we are. And it feels like, yeah, let's bring some good deeds into that weary world. So mm. that's what really resonated with me today. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting one. And then there's something that links this as the kind of encapsulation of a, of a good deed in in something, in an artifact, in a thing that you can hold in your hands as well, um, that a good deed isn't just this ephemeral thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's something really interesting in that for me as well, in, in, yeah. in the context of what we're talking about. So yeah, so the assumption we're talking about today is it, it's just chocolate, um, <laughs> which is a yeah, which is a really interesting one. You know, I think the idea that anything is just anything is actually not really ever it's uh, it's never as simple as that and um um interestingly i think there's a there's a there's a there's a parallel from kind of my former life which i think we share a former life working in technology yeah. uh and working in it and one of the pervasive ideas about that you know that through the through a lot of technologies it's just technology you know it's kind of neutral and it doesn't have an origin and it doesn't have a a, a kind of direction and I've always thought I've always never felt very comfortable with that as an idea. So the idea that anything is just anything is a really interesting one. But chocolate, something that is so ubiquitous, um, yeah. you know, in a kind of ubic like or like so widely available yeah. uh, to us now, is such a that, that anything could be just a, this idea of a commodity, you know, and, and that it's all basically the same. Is a really really interesting one uh, to get into, but. Yeah. So what does it mean for you? What is it that you wanted to, you know, what, what, how do you understand that assumption? That it's just chocolate. Well, yeah. How do, how do you encounter, how does it crop up for you? I suppose initially um, working, making some chocolate products, raw chocolate products, um, the big sort of the first of interaction with that is that people we have this association of chocolate in the in the west or in civilized society or whatever you want to call it you, there's this assumption that chocolate is this sickly sweet thing that is bad for us that's kind of the it's all like it's just like a guilty pleasure and the, all these sorts of sort of terms are associated with chocolate um and it's so much more than that um and as with many things we've taken something that has been found in the throes of empires expanding and in that journey we've taken something that had a very different origin a very different use and that's been then developed and distilled down into something that is a commodity and so it's just chocolate it's just this thing that is associated with being what's oh, bad for me it's going to give me spots it's going to make me fat blah 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 when actually it's so much more than that. It has such a rich history to it and has such a depth to its history that most people don't realize. Um, and the fact that it's been used in so many other ways other than the, the chocolate bars that we all know and love or don't love. Um, mm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just, there's so much depth to, to the history of chocolate. Mm, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, for me, as a, as a, I've, I've, I, I kind of, I'm fascinated by by food history for for all sorts of reasons, and one of one of them is how how 
whatever is now, whatever is how we experience things now is, is, is like, is the normal is the right way to do it. <laughs> um, uh, or is, is, is how it's always been. Mm -hmm. And this idea, you know, of, of, of solid chocolate bars, they've only really been around for what, it's about 150 years, slightly longer. Yeah, it's about that. Not long, not long at all. Um, I mean, the traditional way, um, the very earliest ways it would have been used would have been just literally eating the beans um, or it would have been um, then making drinks out of it. And the drinks would have been strong, bitter and sort of with some spices in um, and it wouldn't have had that sweetness that we've associated it's only when it got brought cacao got brought back to Europe after the, the conquest by the Spanish that we, sugar was put into it to make it more palatable for the civilized European diet which was already kind of heavily sugar based um, and sugar then, yeah um, and it's just changed it and then grants and when it first came to Europe it was as a drink it was a drink um, and it was a hot chocolate drink, but with the sugar added, it's already taking it away from its origins. Um, and then it gradually changed from there and they, through different marvelous scientific inventions and developments, it's got to be said, very clever, um, mm. gone from using a bean, crushing it into a paste and making a drink from it to all sorts of weird and wonderful and fancy things with chocolate these days. So yes, the journey it's had has been very strange and very- yeah. And I, I want to say it's not necessarily a problem that these things develop at all. Yeah, you know, it's not. It, it, it can be a really wonderful thing. I think that's one of the things is when you mention it, people kind of jump. It's like, well, are you saying that's wrong? No. But yeah. It's like it, it's it's a, it's a really interesting one that that you know. But but there is something for me about like you know understanding where something comes from and and how it can sit and how it could be different. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Is, yeah. is a really big part of that so yeah no that, that's so i think there's something really interesting so one of the one of the things i'm very interested in is when when there's an idea out there you know, like it's just chocolate like who benefits from that well how does it work how does it play out you know um why uh, why why would anyone if if we don't think it's why why would someone like you know, why, why is that an appealing idea for someone? I suppose it, a lot of it, it comes down, down to the fact that it's been turned into a commodity. It's been turned into a commodity in the way that it's used. Um, that's not to say it never used to be, because it has always been a commodity in one way or another, but I think the way it's been used as a commodity these days, very much you part of that whole capitalist system that we're, we're in, where everything's about profit, and very much that's what it's for. Um, it's another cash crop, whereas, mm. I mean, people don't know the history and the cacao beans used to be used as currency. Oh, um, really? Yeah, absolutely. So um, all chocolate comes from the, the bean, which is a seed inside of a pod that grows on a tree. And it's like people don't know that. But the, those seeds, those beans were used as a currency. And um, yeah, so there's records, there's sort of so many beans for a chicken, so many beans for a slave, so many beans for a sack of corn, all these sorts of things. Um, so it, it was highly, highly prized and has been for a mm. long time. And as well as that practical level of cacao being used as a commodity, as a means of currency, it also has been used for its for the benefits and the, the attributes it has about giving energy, giving stamina, um, uh, the same way that coca leaves that are used that way traditionally and then using the using in ceremony um to to bless anything and everything essentially bless bless unions bless bless the soil bless the sort of the crops and the agriculture festivals it has been used in those sort of two ways but these days that side has all been lost and obliterated out um, through the conquistadors and the, that journey um, that so much was obliterated, literally obliterated, and the huge amounts of records from the Aztecs were just destroyed by the, by the Spanish. Um, and so that history and that heritage has been lost, or largely lost, not completely, luckily. Um, whereas these days it's just bring it back. How can we sort of refine it into something that we can make even more money out of? And that's been the absolute focus of it, which um, has led us to where we are today, that when people are just largely often feeding a sugar, sugar addiction when they're mm. eating chocolate 
um, and they're eating it without any mindfulness, without any recognition of what it is. It's just getting that sugar fix. Um, if people are into good, better quality chocolates, sort of high end, sort of artisan chocolates, they're still probably to some degree getting a sugar fix. But also, they're they're at least experiencing the different flavours and different qualities that different types of beans have. Um, but it's they're still they're not getting that deeper level of what the history of cacao is. Mm. I, I think it's really interesting as well. One of one of the big things for me around this is this idea of consistency, and and um, the, the the entirely consistent <laughs> commercial product, yeah. and that what people want is consistency, and it, it, it's a really it's, it's almost like people would choose consistent over good. Um, and yeah. th that's and that's almost something that we're told we should choose as well. I've often thought that like, is that 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 it's one of the reasons I've I've heard cited for why McDonald's is successful is because yeah you know you 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 know it's probably not going to be the best meal you can get locally, <laughs> wherever you happen to be in the world. Absolutely. But you also know it has this kind of really consistent standard. Yeah. So you know it's also not going to be absolutely awful, mm -hmm. depending on your perspective. I mean, it, it will taste of a thing and it will do it. It will be the same as it was before and it will be the same as it was that you had in a completely different country. And that that kind of abstraction of context. So it's it's kind of come out of its, the context where it's grown and then it's the same everywhere. Absolutely. And I think that's a, there's something really interesting in that, particularly when you think about its role in experiences and ceremonies and, and like, can we get that? The, you know, it, it's, it, the, it's, it's a completely consistent product, but is it always experienced the same? Am I coming to it the same as well? And I, I think there's all sorts of fascinating yeah. kind of interplays in why that's, uh, why that's attractive for some people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that consistency and, like you say, the, the, the classic story of McDonald's, you can go to a McDonald's anyway and you know what you're going to get. Um, I think that a, a, a large portion of that is it makes it easier for them to then roll it out and replicate it because here's the manual for making X, Y or Z. Go off and do it. Follow this plan. You'll get something which is within a few, few percent of what it is expect, expected to be and then the customers know what they're getting. Um, so I think to some degree that um, that consistency isn't a, it's so much about consumer driven. I think it's driven by the businesses but wanting to be able to scale things up. Whereas if you've got that, um, the, the variability that comes from actually having things not in a manual, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't scale up for a big corporation. Whereas sort of small artisan producers or small artisan cafes or anything like that, they can't really scale up because as soon as they start trying to do that, they then have to come up with standard operating procedures. So it's it's the to have that growth and that scalability. That's I think that's a big been a big driver for the consistency. Um, mm. I would say, yeah, I, I think that and then the customers, the consumers, have then probably conditioned to expect that as well. Yeah, I think that the consistency of experience, and I know a lot of large corporations really do, you know, focus on, on on like the same experience over and over and over again, and and also like optimization within that. So it's like, how can I make this slightly incrementally slightly better? <laughs> I think that there's something really interesting for me in this, in the relationship between that and and ritual and ceremony, and how we, you know, how how we're working with that and how we've got the same steps mm -hmm. but we're kind of going off you know it's like the, the experience is always going to be different and actually the intent isn't always to mediate the same experience each time no, it's yeah. almost you know it's it's to it's to do something different and i and i think that difference is a really interesting part of it I th you well, you mentioned um so the sort of uh, ritual and ceremony and sort of for me, um, if you have if if ritual and ceremony is very much prescribed, this is how it has to be. It then becomes dogma, and I think that's a very different experience because it's 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 not allowing spirit to come through that ritual and ceremony. Mm. Uh, it's becoming it's like this is what you must do. This is my this is what everyone is expected to have as an outcome, and it's like I don't. That's not 
that's not a, opening up to spirit for me. That's becomes dogma, and that's where you keep going down that route. And we we've, we've all seen the problems that have arisen from dogma around the world through <laughs> centuries and centuries of dogmatic imposition of of beliefs, rather mm. than allowing that um, personal experience of connection to spirit and nature and that personal experience of ritual and ceremony. Instead, it's someone stood there in a fancy outfit up on a pulpit telling you what your spiritual experience is going to be. And that's a very yeah. spirit, that's a very different setup uh, and scenario to actually helping and encouraging people to have their own personal experience. So I think that's uh, yeah, something that... It yeah, and it also feels there's interesting parallels between that someone else telling you what your experience is going to be in um, a lot of corporate food production. You know, it's like <laughs> it's been designed for you. You don't have to engage with it. Yeah. Um, there's nothing of you in it, yeah, as it absolutely. were, in yeah. making the thing, which on some on one level is very convenient, mm -hmm. but on another level I find very disempowering. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, you, you don't need someone who's particularly skilled to make something that is just following a step-by-step -step process in a, a standard operating procedure in a manual that's that big for how to run McDonald's or any other chain restaurant of your choice. <laughs> Whereas actually having someone who comes in and creates something with what's available seasonally is a very different experience. And the same with chocolate um, or the big brands who they churn out millions and millions of bars every day and it's press a button, tip that in there, that in there, and you get that. It's like, okay, but where's the, you, that's where you really step away from the essence and the, the craftsmanship as well, whereas smaller craft producers of, of chocolate um, or any product for that matter, they, they, they're bringing their own essence into it, um, mm. and their own creative essence, and that then comes through in the end result. Yeah. I, I, there's also something about the essence of the product for me, and you know, the it's it's the difference between uh you know how it's funny how valuable some vintage wines are you mm. know and what marks vintage is out is that they're different yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Why that's why they're worth it it was a year where something weird happened that did something to the grapes that made yeah. them this, this, this wine taste unique there was uh, not always one, nicer one actually <laughs> This is this is one of the other things about really expensive wines is 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 on by any um, kind of objective measure of like niceness they don't necessarily taste any better than like I, I, I the the last paper I read said the ceiling was at about twenty quid a bottle of wine after that there isn't any kind of objective improvement but what they are is unique mm. you know it's it's that and and I think that that uniqueness and the value of that uniqueness. Um, beyond its kind of objective niceness yeah. is a really, really interesting. Um, and, and that clearly in some domains that is hugely valued. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, on something slightly different, so making furniture, if you've got an absolutely master craftsman who's so skilled in working with wood and produces a one off piece of furniture, you can immediately see the value in it of in how it's built and the, the uniqueness of it and the, that comes through from that craftsman whereas you take that same person and put them in all right make 20 of those make 30 of those very soon it just becomes yet another thing that's being made and th that essence of it is being lost hmm. yeah. so yeah i i, I so I think there's something what I really like to do is is think about how we can kind of, you know, maybe pin this down a little bit so we can play with it uh, and use it. So if we think like, what's underneath this, it's just chocolate, you know, um, perhaps in the context of working with it um, as a ceremonial tool as well. You know, this idea of uh, um, where where the kind of the thing as just a thing ends and it's experience it meets experience and it meets kind of the effect of that experience as well because i think these are these are all kind of things that 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 run together in a certain circumstance but aren't don't don't automatically follow one another and sometimes it's, it's assumed that they do so yeah i i'd really like to get into that you know this idea of what it is 
if if it's not just chocolate, then then what is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier that cacao is considered a plant medicine. It's considered as a heart opener. Um, and this works on multiple layers. And one of the layers is actually chemically, the, the things that are in cacao work beautifully. They, for our hearts, for opening us up, for bringing about states of bliss and joy and love and ec ecstasy, essentially. Um, so there's different chemicals in there which facilitate that process. Um, and We appear to have temporarily lost Dan there. Hopefully he'll join us back again shortly. Um, this is a, as I said, uh, this is this is a live show, so uh, we'll see what's happened. Um, uh, okay. Um, so yeah. Um, ah. Okay. Uh, and we'll just uh, he's dropped and rejoin. So uh, Dan is now back with us. So uh, great. Okay. Um, maybe I'm not allowed to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, yeah the um, I'm not sure the powers that be. Uh, yeah, there's some, something uh, sinister going on with the yeah, yeah. Oh, being censored about chocolate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so so yeah, so cacao's got lots of chemicals in it. So things like anandamide and phenylethylamine, PEA for short, um, and various other sort of components in it, which are just really good for um, so sort of bringing about states of bliss, states of joy, um, ecstasy, those sorts of things. Um, they work along the same sort of pathways as serotonin, and there it's also a what's class called an endocannabinoid. So it's got the human body has receptors for cannabis cannabinoids which are typically found in cannabis um, and there's chemicals in cacao which bind to those same receptors um, so it has it's just our bodies are really designed to be able to work with this and it's considered and has a history of being used in ritual and ceremony as a means of connecting to our hearts and opening our hearts up um, and certainly when I work with it in ceremony that's sort of part of the process is about the group that have come together it's about us connecting together in that sort of resonant field of each other sinking into our hearts and from there being able to look at what's going on for ourselves connect with different parts of ourselves um heal parts of ourselves and have that connection to the circle to the other people in there and then beyond that to the world ultimately um and so it's just that deeper level of working with chocolate so it isn't just chocolate it is something that can take you on a journey can really center yourself in your heart and it's yeah it's, it's just a beautiful magical experience it really is it really is um and yeah i i, I can't keep away from it it's <laughs> Oh, that's great. I, I think it's really interesting for me. You know, there's 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 an assumption related to this that uh, where it's just chocolate also plays out in the the idea that um, a thing the the effects of a thing, um, particularly anything we take into our bodies, whether it's food, whether it's drugs, whether it's whatever, are is consistent and will do exactly the same thing in whatever context. Mm. You know, that, that very mechanistic way of looking at the, the way that the body works. And for me, it's really interesting because it's kind of, for me, I experience this and I think emerging work is that it's much more interactive, mm. you know. And there's this relationship, this ongoing relationship between our physiological state and our mental state. Yeah. Um, and that really, I don't see them as separable on, yeah. an, on any meaningful level. But... Um, uh, that's not to say we can't kind of break them up and work with them. We just have to not forget that yeah. they're very closely related. But but that ability to shift some aspects of it is mm -hmm. a, is a really interesting one. And, and I think cacao is a you know the, the the if you if you if you kind of the traditional approach is that actually the main active ingredient theobromide, which is quite close to caffeine um, in its chemical structure, and um, but it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, so therefore it has no effect on our you know on our psychology at all i'm not sure that that therefore follows <laughs> you know and but but it's also the case that it doesn't have that kind of straight linear effect and so 
I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, how ceremony works with the drug, you know, with the thing you are taking in. I said drug is an interesting word in this context, but um, but with with a plant compound intended to change our perceptive state slightly, um, uh, how those work together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the interesting things I find is that all societies and all cultures have drugs of choice um, and they always have done. Um, and the pervading society that we live in now, the drugs of choice are pharmaceuticals, caffeine and sugar and tobacco, nicotine. And alcohol. And oh, and alcohol, actually, yeah, of course, that was the other one. So those are kind of the drugs of choice, the acceptable drugs of choice. Um, and yet the ones which have all been sort of pushed aside and made illegal, bizarrely, um, are ones which have very different effects, very different effects. And it's like so sort of alcohol and tobacco alone, they just have huge impacts on society, both individually and on a wider level through huge amounts of ill health and sort of death. And then just through with alcohol, the sort of not only that, but also the, the problems of people with getting into those alcohol, alcohol states and fighting and all that sort of energy that is brought and fostered in society by having those as a drug of choice. Whereas other ones, which are all these natural ones which have been pushed out to the side, whether it's things like psilocybin and mushrooms, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's um, coca leaves rather than cocaine, or whether it's it's of the original use of cacao it's they haven't been used they've been pushed aside and actually they have such therapeutic uses in many different ways um and a lot of it is more difficult to make a make a commodity out of them because it's you can't patent a lot of these things whereas a lot of our pharmaceuticals are kind of based on all these natural versions and then patent it because they can then make lots of money with it um so yeah it's um we have a <laughs> with drugs <laughs> yeah and it's interesting how we're slowly you know in, in certainly there's some really interesting research emerging around the mental health and therapeutic benefits of psychedelic therapy and, and some really interesting trials around um i believe lsd and ketamine as well and, yeah, and well. so well. there it it but what's also really interesting about those trials um is having read about them is how much effort they made to make the experience different to just it, it's not just like here's some acid like go about your day yeah no, no absolutely. It, it's a very very different thing yeah. um and, and in a rather um kind of sweet way i thought actually looking at the the pictures and it's, it's like it's a, it's an academic medic's idea of what a therapeutic of a calming therapeutic setting looks like within the limits of what you can achieve in a hospital in a university hospital yeah. and it, it's like which isn't you know isn't actually a glade in the woods um but you know and it's really really interesting how that how that's played out and you know how how as much of the development effort has been around though that side of things yeah. if not more than the the like well here's a drug we, we have that already um, to the yeah. context that it's experienced in, the experience that it mediates, that actually is what does the work. Absolutely. I, I, the, the, there's the classic saying of set and setting. Um, and when working with anything in, in this way, in a sort of therapeutic or um, shamanic ritual ceremonial way, the set and setting is so important. It is part of the experience. It's not just here's the sacrament that you're going to take, here's the medicine, here's the drug, whatever it is. It's actually, no, that's part of it, but it's the, the space that you create, how the space is held, um, the intention that's brought into it. And so there's so many different layers to it, whereas we've got so conditioned into it, so like, I'm not feeling well, here, have a pill. Expect a, an effect in 45 minutes. And it's like, mm, it doesn't really work like that. If you want to get to a deeper level of healing and transformation, it's not about just taking a pill and 45 minutes later you're sorted and the symptoms are gone. Actually, it's getting to the root cause of what's going on for people. And it's the whole experience, the set and setting, the intention that's behind it. So even with these uh, drug trials, um, or not so much drug trials, but these uh, research with all these different sort of psychedelics and sort of so-called illegal drugs, 
they are having to look at the set and setting and take it from being purely clinical to bringing in those things which actually helps nurture it. One of the big things that I've been reading about is that they're, they're looking at how they can develop and sort of train guides who are people who will be able to help people on these journeys. So as these uh, therapeutic uses of things like MDMA comes out, which is amazing for PTSD, but having the therapeutic guides who can help people on that journey. Um, yeah, there's, there's uh, various schools in the US, I think it's at Harvard, they're developing a program to actually train guides and they're looking at, they're gonna need thousands and thousands and thousands of guides over the next 10, 20 years to be able to help on that journey. So yeah, it's not just as simple as here you go. <laughs> and I, I think there's something really interesting, you know, that that this exploratory work and, and the guidance and the, for me, it's it's a lot of the reason that we do this. And I use complexity theory to, to kind of ground and explain some of this. And there's a, the difficulty is when, when, when things aren't kind of clear and mechanistic, but emerge from on top of the interaction of loads of different aspects. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot of the really hard problems that we have now, uh, individually, personally, and uh, collectively, are those emergent problems. Mm -hmm. And they resist that real, like, simple mechanistic thing because they're not in that domain. Yeah. That's like, it's not, it, they're, they're, it, it's a real, but it's a really hard thing to kind of, you know, I still struggle getting my head around it sometimes and being like, well, well okay, what do I do about that? How do, what, how do we engage with that? But for me, a lot of the, you know, the guidance work is actually that, you know, is, 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 is this is a domain we kind of, we kind of co-explore. We don't know what's going to turn up because we can't really predict what's actually causing this on a, you know, there's all these different causes interacting in different ways. So we're going to kind of move into it rather yeah. than just being like, right, fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It is that exploration. I think earlier on you mentioned um, about uh, uh, developing a relationship, um, and it's, it's funny that those those words resonate so strongly with me because when I'm teaching and guiding and mentoring people on their journey with cacao, one of the very first things I say to them is about developing your own relationship with cacao. Um, and that comes through having a clear intention and sort of putting it out and actually journeying on a shamanic journey to connect with cacao and consciously connecting with her and stating the intention that I want to develop a relationship with, with you. I want to understand how to work with you, what your messages are for me, what your healing is for me, let alone anyone else. And through that journey of developing your own relationship with cacao, then someone is able to really truly sort of help other people in their journeys using cacao as a tool and also then helping other people to develop their own relationship and i think the same happens with most plant medicines really um no one just suddenly goes into it and they're like i'm going to work with whatever the plant medicine is and they are they've got to have their own journey to get to that point where they're able to do it safely and with integrity um, and we're actually getting results um, or actually to just get the message from the, the plant to say, yeah, I've done this work for you, but it's not your path to carry on working with yeah. other, other people. And that's yeah. part of, yeah. And it's about that developing a relationship and through that developing a relationship, that's where the real magic comes in. That's where the real, um, the unknown comes in because there's no way of prescribing what is going to happen. Um, what's going to happen on someone's journey. And it, when I, I run my courses, I'm, always blown away by what happens over a five-week course 10 people or however many are on the course the different experiences that people have during that cycle um that you can you know, i can't possibly say right well this week this is going to happen that week that's going to happen i've got an idea but everybody's journey is completely personal and um it's that relationship yeah, it's so important yeah I, I think that 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 level of difference of experience mm -hmm. Is, is a really interesting one to work with. And also there's something around this space of, um, of actually being able to create spaces where more than more, where, where most people, most of the time get their needs met. 
get what they want, <laughs> even though those are different things. And I say most people most of the time because we can't, trying to get it like perfect yeah. is actually a really big barrier to doing it and having it work at all. Mm -hmm. And trying to force a specific set of things on people is actually really unhealthy. <laughs> so like yeah. leaving space for others to kind of co-create and share in it and, and like co, you know, we are, I think, you know, in, in a lot of this idea, you know, if you're the person who invites people into a space is that you're then responsible on some level for holding the whole space. And I think that's actually not necessarily very helpful. It's like you've got you're, 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 you've created the invitation, but then you're creating some space for other people to co-support and you're on the journey with people. And if you're not, then that's that's it for me. That's actually quite an awkward thing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's healthy to be that so you, you want to be able to step back but yeah you 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 also actually want to be there with with people and so it is your own journey first yeah absolutely and every time i'm in a ceremony whether if, if i'm holding the space and, and holding a ceremony it is always a journey for me as well i never know quite what's going to happen and it's it's uh, but it's stepping into that place of the unknown and allowing and being there to to sort of to guide and support that space and as you say, allowing everybody else who's there to bring their energy into that space, which is their own journey. And then collectively our journeys and our energies all mix and hold and create something unique every single time. Um, so, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating um, and blows me away every time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that's a really lovely, you know. A really lovely marker that you're still getting something from it as well and, and that it is a real exploration for you i think this is one of the things is you know one of the big fears for people who are starting out in any of this exploratory work is that they have to kind of um that mastery means complete control over a domain <laughs> um and, and for me mastery is something it's certainly in this space is something very very different um it's a uh, it, it's much more a a, a comfort with whatever might arise yeah. um, than it is actually having a ready answer to whatever whatever will arise. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, it's the the five week journey that I, that I I lead and take sort of guide people on. I've run it four times now. I think it is over the past eighteen months or so, um, and every time it's a new journey for me i know i go through the journey with everyone else and i get new insights and new new understandings about myself about my relationship with cacao about what i'm doing about my life outside of day to day it's just every single time it is an experience for me and i i, I cannot separate that out um and yeah it's part of part of the journey it's interesting you said the word mastery as well because my cacao teaching side of things is called kick out mastery um and yeah absolutely it's n very much not about being the master it's not about someone who has complete control or knowledge or has all the answers it's like no it's like i'm just holding the space i'm bringing what i've got and i bring my experience from all the different aspects of my my journey and my path to this date into what i do and i don't know what's going to happen and that's the beauty of it and it's uh, yeah having that that um ongoing conversation i think with myself and with cacao and with the people that i work with yeah mm. yeah it, it's interesting for me how as my, my frame of reference is much more around other experiential kind of therapeutic contexts um and even the, the entirely self-mediated ones like meditation mm -hmm. um entirely self-mediated that's probably not safe actually <laughs> but, um that's not true uh but uh, kind of generated from within the self first perhaps um and, and so there, there's there's some there's a lot of interesting parallels for me between these these um, and their effect and, and and actually i think one, one of the really interesting things is like what what is what is my kind of area what is mine for and what is just a tool that's interesting for me to play with and explore and learn from mm -hmm. and then for other people to kind of take that journey forward and i think for some people it's there's there's I, i've certainly kind of experienced fear in both directions like if i start something i've got to like mar like completely get all of it and then felt really guilty about putting it down being like okay i've got enough from this and equally i've got i've kind of in the other direction i think i've been like you know well i'm kind of going to 
too far with this it's like it's a, so so it's it's a, you know this is a kind of rabbit hole that, that's going to serve no one and and i think they're they're both they're they're, they're both kind of competing um pulls and, and and both can kind of hold you back from exploring these kind of things in, in a lighter way in a more fun way because i think that's the other part of it for me is 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 there's a play element to this and i think for me there's also you know we were chatting before the show about um doing chocolate making workshops and mm. i think there's yeah. there's an element to this that is about making and how we make um but when making a consistent product isn't actually what we're really intending you know like the making of the product isn't actually the final outcome that we're seeking i think there's something really interesting in that as well because it's like for me that's that's also one of the assumptions whenever i whenever i put anything together or i'm making something it's usually kind of just it's an artifact of what i'm doing and exploring and wanted to do anyway yeah. it's not because i really wanted this thing that i could then sell or i could then do something with or whatever and for me that's actually that's quite deep in the assumption as well that we do you know we sell these things we make a physical concrete product and that's why we would do it mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely it's um the, the traditional sense of business is to like you you do something you make something and it's a product or service that you sell purely for making money and what have you and of course in any business there's an element to that because otherwise if you don't do that then you're not going to survive and not be able to support yourself and your family let alone anything else but absolutely i mean with our our workshops and even the very first product that we made was a, a chocolate making kit um because one of the things that's really important to, to me and my wife is that it's actually about helping people on their journey to start exploring working with chocolate on what they can make so even all those years ago when we started that that was a sort of an aspect of it it's not about this is what you do this is what you make that's the end result well off you go it's actually this is the beginning of a journey and you, it unfolds for you and uh, so yeah and then with the workshops that we do yeah there's a set of recipes that people will make absolutely but it's about getting them to take them from that idea of it's just chocolate to actually there's something else here there's something that has got different health benefits and different properties to it i can work with it in different ways not using the ingredients that i'm used to working with and create things which taste amazing are good for me and are just so unusual to what they're used to and is conventional but it just of shift someone's perspective and then it takes them on the journey um so, mm. yeah. what's the old saying it's like it's not the destination it's the journey that counts isn't it and i think that's so true with working with cacao and uh, i think anything that it feels really important to me that i don't have a destination in mind um, i i think that's yeah I, I find journey a slightly difficult metaphor personally i yeah. because for me journeys are always like okay well i'm going somewhere Okay. Um, yeah. I prefer to think of it of as as a dance or a piece of playing a piece of music, mm -hmm. because the purpose of playing a piece of music isn't to get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. and for me that captures it in a slightly different way. It's just it, and it's entirely like you know we all language has different resonances for different people, but for yeah. me I find I find that more like what we. The thing, what we, you know, it's the it's the experience of the thing, yep. rather than where it gets me, mm -hmm. where I end up in in, in the, the where the real value is in yes. this space. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And like you say, it's a slightly different way of looking at it, but yeah, it's the same the same essence, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, there's something really interesting for me in that, and its relationship to this kind of exploring work and and how that's that's different and, and that's not to say that i, I want to make it clear actually is it that there's not is there's, there is value in this consistency and there is value in the kind of you know the optimization and the within a known sphere and, and i'm very glad that that exists because we get loads of benefits from it i personally get loads of benefits from it yeah. um and i'm also very glad that other people are good at it because i'm really bad at it <laughs> um, so yeah. But uh, but there's an element, you know, this exploratory work is the other side of it, and it, it feels that it can get forgotten, yeah. um, and it's important to. So that's for me. That's why it's important to make the case on the show and on this particular episode about why why it is important to be able to to build that into and finding your relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely absolutely yeah i mean we make a range of chocolate products and there is consistency in that because people expect what they to buy when they get buy our chocolate brownie they expect it to taste a certain way and look a certain way and have that experience when they eat it absolutely and there is another layer to cacao and i think with many things it's sort of there's that convenience of buying something off the shelf um and then there's the exploration of getting the raw ingredients and making things with it and so it's sort of they both have their place absolutely um yeah absolutely so if, if someone's kind of thinking about all of these ideas and you know is, is listen to the show and thought yeah actually this is this is something i want to explore a bit <laughs> in my own way how would you suggest someone would go about kind of exploring any we've, we've covered a pretty wide range so pick wherever you like um, um any bits of what we've spoken about how they might kind of start going about it if you were to give them some kind of um okay so i i guess sort of separating out into to the where we started with this of the two aspects of how i work with cacao on the the raw chocolate side of things of uh, i would say um, the chocolate making kit we we produce is a fantastic introduction of making a nice simple raw chocolate and then using that as the beginning of a journey of exploring how you can work with cacao or something to create your own nourishing food um, so that's a really good sort of introduction there and then on the the ceremonial side um, it's 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 about understanding the concept of ceremony um, I've got a little three part a free three part course which just gives the absolute core essence of what I, I, I believe to be at the foundation of um, ceremony and working with cacao I, I call it the three pillars and it's about intention attention and the cacao um, so that is a really good introduction uh, and a very basic basic level of starting to explore and then from there it's really just start exploring that having those questions and entering into our relationship with cacao, which is sound, can sound a bit strange, but it's, it is. It's about developing that relationship. Um, I've, I've got various sort of Facebook profiles and Instagram and all those sorts of things where I hopefully share some of that um, knowledge with people. And I'm always really keen and happy to, to talk to people and to, yeah, to talk to people and explore what, what's going on for them. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, I think for me that you know you can almost generalize those those yeah. the, those three pillars. The cacao is, is 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 whatever it is that pushes us out of our normal experience. Yeah, you know wh whatever it is that that works for you as an individual as well. And mm -hmm. I think this is and, and being able to play play is a huge part of this because we're yeah. not particularly as adults we're not really. You know, it's not expected to try <laughs> stuff out and play and <laughs> muck around with chocolate and get your hands messy or muck yeah. around with instruments and make a weird noise or paint and make a you know make stuff that we're just not allowed to do that on some level we don't allow ourselves to do that perhaps and yeah. i think for me as, as a letting go of a shit you know i like to add let things people don't have to do anymore like not having to worry about being good and <laughs> it having a specific outcome and just being giving yourself some time to play with something that feels fun for the sake of it yeah um yeah. whatever that is and chocolate is for me is it's actually it's a really good place to start because it's you know you can you you, you know you're going to get something pretty good out of it whatever happens yeah. so um yeah so i think that's a it, it's a, it's a really big one for me but so it's, it's being able to you know intentionally choosing an experience that and then to experience that to engage with that 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 is outside of our day to day is out it is different yeah. and how we can work with that and and, yeah. and whatever comes up with that because that can be quite a challenging space sometimes absolutely absolutely yeah yeah um if, if people do start on the journey of exploring cacao particularly on the sort of more ritual ceremonial way of working with her um yeah it can be very challenging and she 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 can bring things up which <laughs> make you take a step backwards and breathe a deep breath and have to really start dealing with some some own inner 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 work inner demons or whatever that may be and it's but that's the flip side of that is that's the beauty of her she works with you in such a, a lovely gentle way that she helps people through that and carries people through those journeys um and i've i've experienced it myself and the people i work with i yeah constantly in awe of their journeys um, it's, it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to help 
people on those on their journey with cacao it really is uh, it's um I, I never tire of it and i never yeah it's just an honor absolute honor <laughs> I think that 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 gentleness is actually a really important part of this mm -hmm. for me and and being gentle with ourselves and learning to be gentle with ourselves because again it's not something we're very often supported in doing yeah. um it's actually quite a hard journey yeah um and it's also is it's a harder journey because it's not something you can make yourself do <laughs> no <laughs> um, almost the opposite and 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 that's actually you know having some creating circumstances and finding um cacao or any any other anything else that helps you in that journey supports yeah. you in that work is yeah. a really really valuable thing yeah absolutely i mean we we generally our society is very head-based very not heart-centered very not heart connected um and there are so many ways that we can connect to our hearts and sort of start dropping from our heads into our bodies really feeling what's going on and when you do that it can be uncomfortable but it's actually that's our natural space is actually being able to honor and recognize this experiences that are going inside the emotions that are flowing through us and working with them and giving them space rather than stuffing them down all the time and then they all shoot out sideways when you least expect it <laughs> yeah yeah i think that, that that idea of space you know finding finding spaciousness um yeah. Is, is is a huge huge theme for me personally in, in my own work and in in whatever work i'm we're talking about with other people because you know, it, it's i think for me this is and we are very much coming to the end now and i'm aware i want to wrap it up but i think there's something really interesting real interesting resonance for me in that relationship between the personal and what we do and our work in the sense of um what we do for a living uh, and our work in the sense of work with a big capital w yeah. um and for me this kind of playing with this stuff is actually often how we can create a mm -hmm. more a deeper relationship between those two things absolutely absolutely and i i, I feel so blessed that my day-to-day -day work <laughs> is what i love to do and it's something that is that i i get so many, much benefit from and able to help others it really just touches into the core of who i am what my own personal mission is it's just yeah it's i feel so lucky and blessed to be in this place um and it's been a long journey getting here um and i have no idea where the journey is going to take me but that's part of the adventure of it is that the unknown stepping into the unknown the adventure the play that comes from that um and yeah every day is a new journey new step on that journey and it's oh, it's delightful <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely so if people would like to get in touch with you um we've, we've shared a couple of links uh, i think we've got a link to uh both of your, your the websites the, the chocolate making and the the cacao ceremony stuff do you want to yep. share a little bit about what's there what what people might want to engage with yeah um so on the on the chocolate raw chocolate side of things there's a elements for life um it's me and my wife and we make a, a range of raw chocolate products so from raw brownies to hot chocolate blends to uh, chocolate making kit ingredients all sorts of things like that we also sell ceremonial cacao um, and sort of associated things we've got some beautiful handmade ceremonial mugs that have been made for us um and that's a if you want to just that's really if you want to work with cacao more on the I suppose more on the culinary side of things is probably the way of putting it, but it's exploring that journey um, and start transitioning away from mass produced high sugar crap um, to stuff that's a bit more nourishing and uh, has got a different energy to it. And then the other side of things is my cacao mastery, which is my, my cacao ceremony training and mentoring sort of side of things. And that's, yeah, I, I run various online courses. I do online ceremonies. Um, I do in-person ceremonies in a teepee around a fire here in Wiltshire. Um, so if people are interested in, in those, we run those most full of new moons. Um, so yeah, send me a message and you can get onto the, the list to find out about those. Um, and yeah, I'm looking, just always looking to help people and on their own journey with cacao, whatever that may be, whether it's making stuff or whether it's working with it ceremonially. Um, and the sorts of people who work with it ceremonially often are people who are 
yoga teachers or um, therapists in different ways um, and yeah people who work in a more of a holistic space um, and then sort of working with cacao getting their relationship with it and then bringing it into what they do to add an extra dimension it's um, mm. yeah, fascinating to watch yeah that's great thank you so much um, really enjoyed this conversation there's actually quite a lot more i'd like to could have, yeah. could have gone on for quite a lot longer um so yeah um, which is often the case isn't it? and is a mark of it yeah that's just how interesting an era it was so thank you very much oh for thank you the show. Uh, yeah. that's that's great and thank you everyone for watching uh it really is the audience that makes it possible and your support that makes this possible um at the very least it gives me an excuse to talk to really interesting people um <laughs> which is uh which is something i enjoy very much uh so uh the recordings uh the, of this and all the others are available on youtube uh you can see all the past episodes and also it's this show is available as a podcast um if you search for delightful descent on your favorite podcast platform um you should be able to find it there um if you would like to explore some more of this yourself uh, and make your way alongside others doing similar work, um, then uh, you can take a look at divergentpathfinders.com, which is my kind of starting up community of people doing this kind of exploratory stuff. So uh, this show is going to kind of move in a different relationship with that over the next little while. So uh, hopefully there'll be there'll be more of that coming up. Um, but otherwise, uh, I hope this uh, this got you thinking and really got you kind of asking some questions. If it did, do reach out and ask either of us or anyone else. You know, it's all about conversation and exploration. Um, the next episode uh, is going to be I'm going to be talking to Ruben Wax about the assumption you've changed. And I think this is a really, really interesting one. There's so much. Interestingly, we I wasn't expecting any synchronicity with this one for some reason, um, but it always happens. And there's something really big about this pressure to be consistent. <laughs> yeah. um, and this, you know, personally consistent and have consistent output, um, even when it isn't helpful, even when it isn't really true or sincere, um, that, that, that it's almost like consistency over anything else. And, and I think that's an idea we've touched upon and explored today as well. So. I'm really looking forward to getting into this one. Um, the show is taking a bit of a summer break. Um, so we'll be back at 1 p.m. UK time on Thursday. Uh, no, that's the date today. Uh, sorry, Thursday the 19th uh, of August. So just under a month's time. So uh, we will see you then. Um, in the meantime, go out and enjoy the sunshine and make some delightful descent of your own. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>